Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our online worship at Christ Lutheran Vale Church. I'm Pastor Hook, and this is Josh. You are watching an online version of our worship service this morning, and we're happy to share this time with you today. Now, don't forget to follow our Facebook page, Christ Lutheran Vale Church, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Both have tons of great content to help you with your walk with God. You can also follow us on Instagram at CLV Church for another way to stay connected during the week. Now, if you're new to us, we'd love to connect with you better. If you'd like, text the word welcome to our church phone number displaying on the screen right now, and we'll send you a few texts to tell you about our church, and hopefully we will learn more about how we can serve you. Pastor, one of the central teachings of Jesus is his Sermon on the Mount. He clarified the teachings of the Old Testament and set the church on a course of love. <laughs> That's right, Josh. I think the Sermon on the Mount is probably the most teaching, the most important teaching of Jesus. And we'll look at one of those teachings today. And my prayer is that we will learn Jesus' heart. But before we start, why don't you just take a minute to say hi or connect in the comments and we'll get ready to praise God. Bring 
your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is called. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was blotted. The precious Today we gather to learn at the feet of Jesus. At Christ Lutheran Vale, we celebrate everyone who learns from the stories of Jesus and applies them to their lives. If you have given to CLV, you are our partner in forwarding our mission, making loving disciples, through programs like the Helping Hands Fund, where we provide food and short-term assistance to those who have emergency needs, we show the love of Jesus by letting him use our hands and our feet to serve our community. Our goal is to show our neighbors, our loved ones, and our friends Christ's deep and unending love in this world. Whether you have given before or you would like to do so for the first time, you can invest in our mission by going to ChristLutheranVail.org and clicking on I Want to Give at the top right of the page. You'll have a chance right now to do that if you would like. We thank God for all these gifts to bring Christ light and love to our community. And now, Pastor Hook has a message for us. He is going to share a message from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. What do these American pastors have in common? Kenneth Copeland, Pat Robertson, 
Benny Hinn, Joel Olstein, Creflo Dollar, and Rick Warren. All of them, if you know anything about them, all of them are multimillionaires. Kenneth Copeland is the wealthiest at $750 million of net wealth. Then Pat Robertson is $100 million, all the way down to Rick Warren, who's worth $25 million. Now, to be clear, it is not absolutely wrong for a pastor to have money. I mean, there have been many people in history who've had money. King Solomon had money. King David had money. Uh, Lydia, the seller of purple cloth in the early church, was apparently a very wealthy lady. All of these people had power and influence, and they were in the upper 1%, right? And money is one of the ways that we reward people. If you're industrious, if you work hard, if you follow the rules, if you save your money, if you sacrifice, there will be people that will become wealthy, right? Some have inherited wealth. Some have created a product or a service that makes the world better. And so they should be rewarded for finding that. That's how our society works. And sometimes God just simply blesses people with wealth. It happens. And God needs Christians in every economic level to be able to relate to the world around us. Wealth can open doors. I remember a pastor friend who was into sports cars and had a very, very expensive sports car. And he was able to hang around with other people who had this very same expensive sports car. It opened doors for him. And it was one of the ways that he could talk to people that he normally wouldn't be able to talk to. But wealth is just that. It's wealth. It's the currency that drives our world but it isn't the currency that drives the kingdom of God. There are huge blessings to having wealth, but there are dangers also. More importantly, wealth can be a symptom of a deeper issue. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're nearing the end of our Sermon on the Mount, and we've spent the last 17 weeks talking about it, and today we're going to talk about something that Jesus warns us about. And this is warning about true and false prophets. This is from Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 15, where Jesus says this. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? or figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, and thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Jesus is finishing up the, the Sermon on the Mount and his teachings about the kingdom of God, and he's encouraging his followers to remain true to these teachings. But he says that there's a danger, and the danger is this. There will be people, false prophets, false teachers, who will come and try to distort his message. The kingdom of God will be hijacked by these people who will take advantage of Jesus and his popularity and his teachings to turn them into their own advantage. And these people, according to Jesus, are wolves that are dressed up like sheep. And we're going to dig into this a little bit. Um, what is a false prophet? I mean, what does that mean? It means that a person who on the inside of every outward appearance looks like they're a follower of Jesus, but, there's not, but they're not. At some level, it's more about them and themselves and their power and their influence than it is about the kingdom of God. You could call them pseudo-prophets if you want to. They're not teaching the messages and the lessons that Jesus taught. They're distorting them, and they're teaching a whole different gospel. And apparently, Jesus was right, as he always is, 
Because even in the early church, there were people, even at the time of Peter and Paul, who were distorting the message of Jesus for their own gain. Uh, Peter writes about this in his second epistle, chapter 2. Listen to what he says. He says, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce secret heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves, and many will follow their depraved conduct. Or in 1 John chapter 4, where John says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets had gone out into the world. Or, or Paul, uh, his first letter, his second letter to the Corinthians chapter 11. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. And there are more passages like this in scripture, but you get the point. Even at the very foundation of the church, there were false teachers and false prophets. They introduce themselves and they say, we are teaching Jesus. But if you dig deep, you'll find out that they're not teaching Jesus at all. And sometimes they even deny the teachings of Jesus and teach something totally different. So Paul says, Peter says, we need to test them. We need to make sure that these teachings are in line with scripture. And how do you do that? You know scripture. And you compare scripture with the teachings of these people. And that's one way that you can detect, detect a false prophet. But you can't always detect a false prophet. Sometimes they are so deceitful that, my goodness, they look like a sheep, they act like a sheep, they um, bleat like a sheep, but in actuality they are a wolf in sheep's clothing and they are waiting for their opportunity to pounce and destroy you. Um, it reminds me of Little Red Riding Hood, right? Who goes to see her grandmother. And she says, my grandmother, what big eyes you have and big ears and big nose. And the grandmother is like, so I can hear you, so I can see you, can I, so I can smell you. Uh, and somehow, Little Red Riding Hood couldn't recognize the, the wolf from her grandmother. And so the wolf gobbled her up. I mean, that's how easily we are taken in by false prophets. And detecting them can be difficult. Detecting anything that's false can be difficult. I mean, just take a look at your wallet and look at your currency, the money that's printed by the United States. Uh, we just take it for granted that every bill that's in our wallet is an actual bill that was pr printed by the United States, and it's true and it's not counterfeit. But we know that there is counterfeit currency going throughout the world that looks and tastes and feels like good American dollars, but they're not. And according to the Federal Reserve, there's quite a bit out there. And even if you are an expert in, in looking at counterfeit bills, sometimes the experts can even be fooled. Uh, I mean, if you just think about it, right, what is a bill? It's just something that was printed by a certain process with certain materials and certain things in the bill. And if you know what all of those things are and you have enough money, you can print your own. Back in 2002, there was a, uh, uh, in Britain, there was a bunch of people that, uh, but that were printing their own American $100 bills. And they were so good that they fooled the Bank of England. The Bank of England looked at it and said, this is a true bill. And it took uh, the U.S. Uh, security services to kind of investigate this and track it down and set traps until they could actually come to the place where they found out that they had their own printing press, their own currency that they were printing. They, for a period of 18 months, they were printing $350,000 bills, which apparently equates to $35 million over 18 months. And it was almost impossible to detect because no matter how you good you are, no matter how many security features you put in your $100 bills, once they are learned by people that want to print counterfeit currency, they will do it 
and they will get away with it. I'm told that uh, in North Korea, they have a huge printing press that prints, this is all speculation on the internet, but printing press that's printing currencies from around the world. Not all the currencies are as complicated or sophisticated as the United States. And of course, you can't go and, uh, and use their government to find out if this is true or not. So apparently, it is just difficult to, uh, to detect counterfeit currency. The only way you can detect, really truly the only way you can detect, is to put security feature after security feature and maybe stay one step ahead of the thieves that want to print it. And there will always be people that will be duped by counterfeit currency. And there are many people today who say and look and act as if they were followers of Jesus and, and they're preaching the words of Jesus. And it may seem like that they are not false prophets. But if you investigate and you look, and Jesus knows that some of these people are, invest, are false people. And the gospel is distorted. They may be teaching in the arena of Jesus, but are they really teaching the true gospel of Jesus? I mean, how do you know? How do you know if there are people that are preaching good, true gospel of Jesus stuff or if they're false teachers that are making it all about themselves? Because you can't tell by their outward appearance, can you? Well, are there people like this in the world today? And I would say, yes, there have to be because the gospel of Jesus is being distorted. And how do I know the gospel of Jesus is being distorted? Is because we have people in this world who are followers of Jesus Christ that, that are not being edified by the message of Jesus. If you look at what Jesus taught, he taught a message of peace and hope and love that fills us with strength and courage for the journey ahead. And so if you have people that are not filled with strength and peace and courage for the journey ahead, maybe they're not being taught the true words of Jesus. I mean, who knows? Um, maybe I'm a counterfeit prophet. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Uh, how do you know that I'm not some alien life form? that I go home at night and I take off this shell of a skin and really underneath, I'm a cockroach. Um, if you've ever seen uh, the movie Men in Black, right? That was a guy, he, was, uh, he looked like a human, but he took off his skin at the end of the day and he was really a cockroach. I mean, maybe I'm that, right? I mean, you know that Mrs. Hook has a whole aquarium full of hissing cockroaches here in the Hook household. And how do you know those aren't our brothers and sisters? Hmm, I don't know. How do you detect? How do you detect people who are, that look, smell, taste, feel like kingdom people and they are disguising themselves so well, how do you know that they're truly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, Jesus tells us. He says, listen, there are wolves in sheep's clothing and you can't detect them. You can't put them under a microscope and see their fibers and see if they're counterfeit money or real money, right? What do you do? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, by their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from thistles? Likewise, every tree that bears good fruit is a good tree because only good fruit comes from good trees and bad fruit comes from bad trees, right? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown into the fire and this, by your fruit, you will know. That's how you tell. You can look and touch and taste and feel and say, yeah, they are followers of Jesus, but the true test or one of the true tests is are they bearing good fruit? Observe their fruit. Does that tell you? When I was in college many, many, many years ago, I took a class in epidemiology. Um, it had to do with uh, sewer systems and septic systems and things like that. Um, and it talked about diseases and how diseases are transmitted and that sort of thing. Now, I remember back then, this was 40 years ago, there was a test that you could test for E. coli, Escherichia coli, right? Uh, and that E. coli bacteria was very, very deadly. But we found out in this class that the vast majority of strains of E. coli are not deadly. Um, but it's the easiest one at that point, 40 years ago, that you could test for. And if you found E. coli in somebody or in some food, 
um, then that would tell you that there were probably other deadly viruses that were around. Uh, and so uh, they tested for E. coli or the good forms of E. coli because it was easy to test for. But if you found this E. coli, then it was an indication that there was also other diseases, including bad E. coli diseases that were around. Well, if you want to test a false prophet, how do you do it? By looking at the fruit. Are they bearing good fruit or are they bearing bad fruit? Whenever I hear Paul talking about bearing good fruit or bad fruit, I'm, torn, you know, I'm taken all the way back to Galatians chapter 5 where Paul talks about good fruit and bad fruit. He says in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. This is bad fruit, right? Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bad fruit. You can see it. You can touch it. You can taste it. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, against which there is no law. You might not be able to see and look whether or not they're a false teacher, but you can see the fruit that they bear. And their fruit that they are bearing will tell all the story about them. If you see somebody preaching in the word of God, but in their personal life, they are prone to some of these things, hatred, discord, jealousy, anger, fits of rage, then you might want to stop and pause and say, are they in the kingdom of God? Are they preaching Jesus' true message? Are they worth listening to? And my friends, there are voices like this in the church too. And do any of these voices claim to be followers of Jesus? Because like a true prophet of Jesus, you people who are in the kingdom look like Jesus, right? A true prophet looks like Jesus. And if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right, you'll get a picture in your head of what Jesus looks like and what he says and what he does and the fruit that he bears. And so you can look at that and say, is that person that I'm following is, do they look like Jesus? Are they a true prophet? Because a true prophet bears fruit that looks like Jesus. You see, we all bear fruit in our life, right? We have all things that we hold on to and say, that is the standard that I should live by. But in the world, well, the world sets its own standard. The world says, uh, you have to go to this school, or you have to drive this kind of car, or you have to live in this kind of neighborhood, or you have to have these things in your life. And if you do these things, then the world will say, yeah, you are uh, acceptable by the world's standards. Well, none of that, none of that applies to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has a different set of standards that, they, that God has set. And those are the standards by which we should look. Peace, love, joy, kindness gentleness, faithfulness. And see, that's where I have a concern with some of the more famous preachers, right? Because one of the things that Jesus taught, the main thing that Jesus taught, if you ask me, is that our strength and our security does not come from things of this world. Our strength and security as a follower of Jesus is something deeper. It's the power of the Holy Spirit living in our life. It's God's living in our life that gives us wisdom and strength and power and peace and joy for living, right? Um, these are the things that we cling to and we get strength from. And they help us grow our faith and then our faith helps get stronger. And then we can live in this world that is a very deadly and dangerous world. We don't have to rely on worldly wealth because we have Jesus. And when you have Jesus, you have everything. And if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. And worldly wealth may come and go, but Jesus never comes and goes. He comes into our life and he stays and he resides in us. And he gives us everything that we need for life. So if you are one of these people that has an incredible amount of wealth, you might be sending a message to your followers that says, that if you want to be a follower of Jesus, or that, that the only way to have strength and security in your life is to have wealth. 
And because you have wealth, you don't even need Jesus. Or maybe Jesus takes a secondary position in your life. Or maybe these people say, listen, if you want to have wealth, you know, follow me or follow these teachings and Jesus will actually give you wealth. Or even very, very worse and more perverse than that is follow me and Jesus will give you all the wealth you can possibly need. Um, and, and look at all the wealth that I have. And if you follow me, Jesus will bless you just like that. My friends, that is a perverse teaching. Now, I don't follow any of these people that I mentioned at the beginning. I don't know what they teach or who they are. Some of them may be incredible men of God. I don't know. I will leave that up to God to judge. But what I do know is that it does send a mixed signal to say, rely on earthly things. And oh, by the way, Jesus gives you all the power that you need. That is a very difficult message. This isn't Jesus. Jesus took a totally different way of looking at life. Jesus lived a life of simplicity and austerity and peace and love and joy. And if you follow Jesus, truly follow Jesus and live the life that he did and bear the fruit that he did, you will live a life as full and rich and beautiful as the life of Jesus. And you don't need the things of this earth to be successful. The people of this world may see that you need these things to be successful, but to be truly following Jesus, you don't need these things. You just need Jesus and his spirit and his word and his life in you. That's why I think about, you know, I, 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 our congregation. I mean, I want our congregation to be successful, right? But there is a danger in that the more successful we become as a congregation, the more we don't have to rely on Jesus and his spirit and his uh, power living in our life, we rely more and more on wealth and our own power as a congregation. See, that's a dangerous way to go. The whole purpose of us joining together is to make loving disciples that look like Jesus. And however we can do that with whatever gifts God's given us, that should be the goal. That alone should be the goal. And if God blesses us with other things, then praise God for that. We take those things that God has given us and pour it back into the community and the world so that we can spread his love and his joy and his peace in the world. I, I sometimes think of uh, Vincent van Gogh. His actual German name was Vincent van Gogh. Uh, what you may not know about this famous painter uh, is that he was... A priest. He was actually uh, trained for the priesthood, was given a rectory where he lived. Uh, he was given an allowance uh, and he would take this money that he was given. And the purpose of this money was to upkeep the rectory, to have, you know, nice things so that when dignitaries came uh, to meet him, he'd have, you know, nice things that he could serve and nice things for people to sit on and could interact with the upper crust of the society that he lived in. But Van Gogh was a very um, empathetic person and he walked around the streets and he saw people suffering. And so he took the money that was given to him that he was supposed to keep the rectory up to date uh, and he would hand it out. And he would you know, try to do what little he could to solve problems of the poor around him and relieve some of the suffering around him. Uh, and if you've heard of the story, apparently the people that were in charge, you know, his superiors, uh, got very angry with him. They got very bitter with him and they told him, you can't do this. This money needs to stay in the church. You can't spread it around. And it, it caused such a emotional damage in Van Gogh that he left the priesthood, and became a painter. And apparently he was a tortured painter if you look at his paintings. And apparently his paintings are worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars today. The one thing that he was trying to avoid is actually the one thing that he became, which is a very famous painter with very famous paintings. But they're probably more famous because of who he was as a painter and the struggle that he went through more than anything else. Um, but that's Van Gogh, the painter. But all of us struggle with this, right? All of us at some level, level have to live in the world and in the kingdom. 
And all of us, because we are tainted with that original sin, are tempted by things of the world that say, I need those things so that the world thinks I'm perfect or that I'm good uh, or that I'm worth listening to. And, And so all of us struggle at some level with things of the world. And all of us struggle to reflect Jesus and to bear good fruit. And none of us do it perfectly because the only person that did it perfectly was Jesus who came to this world and bore good fruit and did not bear any bad fruit. And because of that, he was able to then rescue us from the times that we don't bear good fruit to cleanse us, to bring us into the kingdom, to take the things that we do as a church and somehow mold them and shape them so that even though that we don't always bear good fruit, he still gets his kingdom work done through us. And that's a huge blessing. Blessing. We can try to live a life that bears good fruit, but we will fail. Every once in a while, we need his righteousness and not our own. We need his fruit and not our own. We need his spirit and not our own because we mess it up. And yet, even though we do, he still gets his work done through us. So my friends, test the spirits. Follow people who look more like Jesus and less like the world. But know that none of them are perfect. So all of them need his presence and his love and his grace and his forgiveness. And may his spirit help us to be content with whatever blessings that he provides in our lives. And may his spirit help us to see and bear good fruit. And may his forgiveness always abound in us. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Uh, Just an announcement that I have. Trunk or Treat is coming up on October 29th. And this is one of those times when we do bless the community around us. We do not charge a dime for any of the candy that we hand out. And kids can come come have a great time. Um, This is our giving back to our community. One of the ways that we give back to our community. Um, And so that actually, because it is a gift from us to the community, we have to raise all the candy and all the different things. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, you can sign up. Uh, You can, you don't even have to show up for trunk or treat, but you can uh, give candy. Uh, You could uh, pray for the event. You can certainly um, be there at the event and hand out candy. You can be one of the workers at the event of which we need very many. And so there is a sign up genius going around in our email that you can sign up for those things. And that's October 29th, so it's a couple weeks from now. Um, Other than that, um, I pray that God richly blesses you this week, and we will see you next week. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Oh, thanks be to God.